Historical Jesus 15, Crucifixion. Because the Gospels have so much to say about the crucifixion of Jesus, including His arrest, the trials, and the actual crucifixion itself, and we are just going to spend 30 minutes, it's necessary that I leave out all sorts of details. And so I may leave out details that you love the best, and if that happens, I'm sorry, it's not on purpose. I'm just going to cover a, a, an abbreviated version of his arrest, trials, and crucifixion in an effort to really highlight four scenes. The first is I'm going to begin in the Garden of Gethsemane, then I'm going to look at how Jesus stood before Caiaphas, and then before Pilate, and then last of all, the crucifixion itself. And then next, we'll look at the resurrection. So, last time we left off, if you remember, we were at the Last Supper, and Judas had left during the Last Supper, and he had gone off, and then Jesus went on and he taught and explained to them how they should carry on when, he, when he's gone. And then... He prayed for a whole chapter, John chapter 17, Jesus prayed, and then after that they sang a hymn and they went to the Mount of Olives. And when they came to the Mount of Olives, they arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane. And when that was happening, we read in John 18 that Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Just in case you're curious, Gethsemane means oil press. So this is the oil press, a place where you squeeze the olives to get the olive oil out. Uh, at least maybe it had been, it wasn't anymore, maybe it was still in operation, I don't know. But that's what Gethsemane means, and that's the garden he was at. It's still there today, although the site is disputed. But you can visit all the potential sites of Gethsemane in Israel today. And uh, so this is Jesus' last chance to escape. This is it. He knows what G Judas is doing. And he's gone to the place he knows Judas knows he'll be. And these are his last moments of temptation to abort the plan, Operation Salvation. And, it, and if he hedges here, if he escapes here, if he runs away or somehow diverges here, everything gets messed up. So Jesus has to stay true. And, and this is the calm before the storm. He's in this garden. It's dark. He has his disciples with him. And he brings them to a certain place, and he says to them, sit here while I pray. And then he grabs three of his other closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and he takes them and, and he walks with them a little farther, and then he says to them, watch and pray here. And then he goes a little farther. Actually, what he says to them, what he says to them, and this is just to the three, is, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. It gives you a picture of what Jesus emotionally was going through here. He, it says that he was distressed. He was troubled. He was sorrowful. Jesus was shaken in this time. He went a little farther. He fell to the ground and he prayed these words. Mark 14, 36. And he said... Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. This prayer tells us that Jesus did not want to die. He did not want to go through with it. You don't ask for another way if you want to go through with it. Right? Have you ever prayed a prayer like this where... God, all things are possible for you, and then you ask what you want. And so when he says, take this cup from me, he's not talking about a physical cup. He's talking about the cup of suffering that he's about to endure. He does not want to, he knows what it's going to look like, how nasty it's going to be, and he wants to know if there's another way out. And this is not him going through the motions. This is him in sincerity, in the darkness of the garden, shaking on the ground before his God, praying and petitioning. And then he came back, and he found them sleeping, it says in verse 37. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? 
Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so he went away a second time to pray by himself. And this time he said, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. You know, we get just little summaries of what he said. I'm sure there were probably other words he used. But there's an intensity of heart here. And he came back again and found them sleeping. And the scripture says their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. Can you just imagine the embarrassment of the disciples? He's already told you stop sleeping. And then he found you sleeping again. And they didn't even know what to say. And so he went away. And now Jesus is totally alone. He's spiritually alone. His, his, his top three closest disciples are literally sleeping on the job. They're not even praying along with him. His other disciples, who even knows what they're doing? They're probably arguing about who's the greatest. <laughs> and there is Jesus alone with his God on his face a third time in prayer. And his prayer, once again, is simple. Let this pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In other words, I will do it if it's the only way. Then he came back and he found his disciples asleep again. He woke them up and he said, they're coming. And Judas approached and he came up to Jesus, identifying him with a kiss. And Jesus said, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And then they arrested him and took Jesus away. The band that came was a band of soldiers and officers from the chief priests. They were carrying swords and clubs and lanterns and torches. This was a serious group of people to come arrest Jesus. When Jesus stood before Caiaphas, Caiaphas, of course, is the high priest. When Jesus stood before Caiaphas, Caiaphas is a Sadducee. Do you remember what I said about the Sadducees? The Sadducees are the ones who are in charge of the temple. The Sadducees believe the temple is everything. When it comes to worshiping God, what matters, yeah, the law is important, but what part of the law? Leviticus that describes what you do in the temple, right? And so the Sadducees' emphasis on the temple comes to bear because Jesus had messed with the system. He had turned over the exchanging tables for the coins, right? He had disturbed all the sacrificial system in the temple, he had gotten their attention, which is why we read in Matthew 26, verse 3, it says, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. This is before the arrest. They're already plotting together to kill him, but they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. How delighted must Caiaphas have been when Jesus' own disciple came to him and said, what do you give me so that I tell you where he is, when you can get him, when he's away from the crowd? And so Caiaphas took Judas up on that, and now he finally has Jesus in his clutches. But Caiaphas is not, he's not going to act rashly. He's not just going to kill Jesus. He doesn't, he's legally not allowed to just kill people. Even though he's the enforcer of the, the Sanhedrin, the council that makes these sorts of decisions, the Romans had decided that only they could authorize the capital punishment. Okay? And so if Caiaphas got caught killing Jesus, Caiaphas would have to answer to Pilate. Caiaphas doesn't want to do that. So he want, what he wants to do is, is somehow arrange things so that they can find Jesus guilty and bring him to Pilate. And then if Pilate kills Jesus, it'll be public. It'll be a spectacle. It'll be something that everyone sees. And then everything is dealt with, and he didn't even have to, he didn't even have to do the dirty work. He knows that Jesus is dangerous. He knows the people love Jesus. And so he needs to have a semblance of justice. So he starts fishing for testimony. And he needs to have two witnesses. According to the Jewish law, you have to have two witnesses that corroborate a crime. And 
what ends up happening is two people or different people come forward and the only accusation that might potentially stick is that they heard him once say that he will destroy the temple made with hands and in three days build another not made with hands. In any court of law, that is not a crime to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, that's really weak. I mean, look at the virtue of Jesus. Even his enemies, just they really have nothing on him. And Caiaphas is getting more and more agitated and frustrated. And then he turns to Jesus and directly confronts him. And the high priest stood up, Matthew 26, 62, and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. This is a moment of truth right here, right? Jesus, at this point, could say, well, I am the Messiah, but it's not what you think. I'm just the kind that dies for your sins. I'm not here to cause any troubles, guys. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus takes the path of courage. He is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. And so he says, you have said so, but... I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Woo! That's a bold yes. Yes, I am the Messiah, and you're going to see me sitting on the clouds of heaven and coming, or sitting on the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That is a bold yes. So bold that the high priest tore his robes, look at that, and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? This was a, a practice the Jews had when they would get extremely angry and, and, and just outraged. They would tear their clothes, and for the high priest to do it, it would just be the most shocking incident for everyone gathered in the scene here at this mock trial. Blasphemy! Verse 66, what is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face, and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? We know from Mark that they covered his face while they struck him and asked him to prophesy who was the one hitting him. And so there's a, an irony to this situation. I mean, it's a horrible situation, obviously, but there's an irony that's, that's right on the surface here, and it's a thick iron, irony because here you have Caiaphas and Jesus, and they're both claiming the same thing. They claim to be God's supreme representative on earth, the Messiah and the high priest, right? One of them is the genuine, and one of them is the imposter, they both are claiming to represent God on earth. They claim to have a special, a special relationship to God, to have a unique and intimate way to access God. I mean, what does the high priest get to do? Go into the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place, only one person, once a year. That's Caiaphas. And yet, what's Jesus doing? He's going around calling God his Father. Jesus claims that intimacy. Caiaphas claims that intimacy. They both claim to speak with God's authority. And they claim that the people should trust them because they're acting for the good of the people. Both of them are claiming all these things. The one who was spiritually dead will physically live while, the condemning, while condemning the one who had life in himself to death. The whole scene reeks of envy and hypocrisy. They can't stop Jesus any other way. So they come around the side, they arrest him at night, and they have this kangaroo court where they're going to make him incriminate himself. It's a supreme miscarriage of justice. And look at them, they're carrying on like animals. Right? They're, they're, they're spitting in his face, they're, they're hitting him, they cover his head, they, they, they strike him and they say, prophesy if you're the Christ. Who is it? In the third scene, I'd like to turn to Pilate. Of course, there are other events that intervene in all of this. But Jesus then eventually gets to Pilate. And I don't know if you remember from Pilate from class three. I talked about Pilate to you a little bit. Pilate 
was not a nice guy, and he really disliked the Jews. He did not, I don't think, appreciate his post as the Roman governor. I think he would have rather been somewhere else. For example, once he disguised his soldiers in the rabble, and he had a prearranged signal, and when he gave the signal, his soldiers took out hidden daggers and sliced and stabbed the crowd so that they stampeded, killing many. And other times, Pilate gave in. Although he hated it, sometimes he had to give in. For example, one time they rioted and they, they protested him bringing in the Roman standards into the city. And so he, he challenged them on it and he was threatening to kill all the lead men. And they fell to their knees and bared their necks and said, we'd rather die than break our laws. And he yielded because he didn't want to kill all the leaders of the people. But he, I don't think he liked it. But sometimes he yielded. Another time, they brought, he had brought these shields into Jerusalem with the carved name of Tiberius on them. And then the Jews protested to the emperor and said, you've you got to get these shields out of our town. This is a holy city, and if you don't get them out of here, we're just going to go crazy. And he ordered Pilate to take the shields away. And Pilate had to do it. So Pilate is a stern man, and yet he's pragmatic. <laughs> And when he has to give in, he will give in. And I think you really see that when he faces Jesus. Generally, he's inflexible and dismissive, but also pragmatic. So they bring Jesus to Pilate, and Pilate's first statement is dismissive. So they, they, they bring Jesus, he's, he, he's, he's beaten up, and they bring him to him, and they, and they want him to do something with Jesus. Before they get to any of that, Pilate just kind of waves them away. Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. That's what Pilate says. And they explain, well, we're seeking the death penalty. Oh, you're seeking the death penalty. Only the Roman governor can authorize that. So he takes Jesus into the praetorium, into his headquarters, and he interrogates Jesus. And we have a lot of details on, of that interrogation in John chapter 18 and 19. But he decides that Jesus is not guilty of any crime. So he brings him back out. And he says, I don't think he's guilty. I don't find any crime in him. And they reply, he stirs up the people throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. Pilate says, whoa, did you say Galilee? He's a Galilean? This guy, is he Galilean? Is he Galilean? Yes, yes, he's Galilean. Okay. You know, Herod Antipas is in town. Let's, let's just give him to Herod. You know, he, Pilate just does not want to deal with it at all. And so he sends Jesus over to Herod Antipas, and Herod inter, inter, interrogates Jesus, and, and, and uh, is, you know, the, his men rough him up even more, and then send him back to Pilate. So he comes back from, from Herod, and Pilate says, look, even Herod didn't find him guilty. He sent him back to me. What do you want me to do? <laughs> we read this in Mark 15, verse 6. Pilate decides he's, got a, uh, he's going to try to release him. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. <laughs> Check this out. I don't know if you already knew this or not, but Bar is the word for uh, son. And Abba is the word that Jesus used to pray to God. His name is Son of the Father. So you have one who's the Son of God and the other who's claiming to be the Son of God, at least in his name. And Pilate's asking the people to choose between which Son of God do you want? The murderous, insurrectionist, revolutionary, or Jesus, the King of the Jews? You pick. It's a pretty dramatic moment. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. He, he perceived that it was just envy. Pilate didn't want to give in to them. I don't think Pilate was necessarily a virtuous person. I know from reading these other things about him that he was kind of a jerk. But he also did not want to give in. He didn't want to be played. So he's, he's trying to fight against what they're trying to do, while at the same time not 
lose control of the crowds. Verse 11, But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! From what I can tell, no less than eight times Pilate tried to release Jesus. The first being when they arrived at first, he tried to dismiss him. After that first interrogation, he said he found no crime in him. Number three was when he found out he was a Galilean. He sent him to Herod. I mentioned that. Number four is after Herod sent him back, he decided to punish him and release him. Number five is when the crowd requested him to release a prisoner, he put Jesus up, but they insisted on Barabbas instead. Number six is when the crowd shouted to crucify him, Pilate argued back against the whole crowd and suggested he punish and release Jesus instead. And then Pilate has Jesus whipped. He sends him to the soldiers and they tie him and they beat him mercilessly with this whip. And they dress him in a purple robe with a crown of thorns and they mock him and they beat him in the head. And then Pilate brought him out in this weakened condition, bloody. And once again told the shouting crowd, to crucify him themselves, since he didn't find any crime in him. And then the eighth time was after he heard Jesus claim to be the Son of God, he brought him into the praetorium and tried to release him again. They, they said to him, he claimed to be the Son of God, and therefore he has to die. It really kind of spooked Pilate at that point, because he's already had him whipped, he's already beaten him, he's... he's Pilate already has blood on his hands by this time. And in verse 9 it says, he, Pilate entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, and this is really where they get Pilate, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Now look, if you're not my friend, that's okay. But if you're not Caesar's friend, that's a big deal. That's a big deal as we read on. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So this is really the clincher where it gets political. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. That's so evil, isn't it? I mean, that, you're giving them the choice between Jesus, the Messiah, and Tiberius, Caesar, and they say, We'll take Caesar. I mean, obviously, this is, this is, uh, there's a lot of envy here. There's a lot of hatred. But it's deeper than that. This is spiritual. There's a spiritual hard-heartedness, uh, a, a, a demonic influence going on here that's beyond what you can normally explain, right? And I, I think you'll see that thicken as we get to the fourth scene, the scene of the crucifixion itself. And so Pilate brought out a bowl and washed his hands in front of everyone and said, oh, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Of course, he did have him severely beaten, and then he did give the order to crucify him. So I don't know if washing his hands really did it. But I'm not his judge. And then he ordered his soldiers to crucify him. Roman crucifixion was as brutal as it was public. The point of crucifixion 
was to dishonor. It attacked someone's dignity. It wasn't just to, to, to feel pain. It was to make a public embarrassment, to humiliate someone. And then other people would be deterred from committing the same crime. You don't crucify people for small crimes. It was a, a nasty, it was like the electric chair in our, in our society or lethal injection, crucifixion in their society. Okay? And so the whole idea is as people are, are up on that cross and, and they were, crucif crucifixion was a fairly routine event that happened during this period. As people are up on that cross, people looked at those who were crucified and they said, what did they do to deserve that? I'll be sure I don't do that too. Right? And so the, the theological meaning of the cross was if you mess with Caesar, this is going to happen to you. At this time, that's what the cross meant. And so they stripped Jesus naked. They gambled for his clothes and they hung him up on a wooden cross with nails through his wrists and feet. And then from his high position, he saw his mother. He saw his mother Mary and his aunt, along with Mary Magdalene and Mary, the wife of Clopas, and one of his disciples. There's a little group there. And he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Gives you an in indication of the state of Jesus' mind as his blood is dripping and he's hanging on the cross in agony, his nerves on fire, blood everywhere, sweat. And what's his concern? My mom. I want my mom to be taken care of. It's beautiful, isn't it? So he, he, he makes provision for his mother to be taken care of by this disciple that's there. And then they attach a sign above his head. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Again, this is thick irony. The, the purpose of the sign is the accusation. That's what people are supposed to read, and it was written in all these different languages, so everybody could read it. And the, the idea is it's an accusation. You know, so-and-so killed uh, uh, two soldiers while they were resupply, on a resupply run or something like that. It wasn't like, the, they said, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That's true. That's the irony of the sign. It's all true. It's not an accusation. It's not a false accusation. It's, it's, it's not even an accusation at all. It's his identity. It's who he is. He is the King of the Jews. He is Jesus of Nazareth. And some of the Jews even complain. You know, Pilate, you should write, he said he was the King of the Jews. And Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. You know, there was, I'm not, there's no eraser here. You know, we're going to stick with the sign we got. He was pretty inflexible. But anyhow, people started reading that sign. And instead of having any kind of compassion on Jesus, it got even worse. I want to look at these three mockings of Jesus. Matthew 27, 39. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. <laughs> if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. You know what that reminds me of? Who said, if you are the Son of God? Reminds me of the devil in the temptation in the desert after 40 days. That's who that reminds me of. Because he said, if you're the Son of God, turn the stone into bread. Right? If you're the Son of God, come down off the cross. Do you know that Jesus would have to you know, barely snap a finger and 12 legions of angels would get him off the cross. <laughs> and he had to stay on that cross. This is a temptation. Mark 15, 31. So also the chief priests. So those are just people passing by. And then the chief priests, the leaders of the people, with the scribes, mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Come on down, then we'll believe. And then the third in Luke 23, 36 is the soldiers also mocked him, coming up, offering him sour wine and saying, 
If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. They're mocking him. But in that whole instant, there is one who stuck up for Jesus. There is one. One of the criminals in uh, Luke 23, 39, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the only one who defended Jesus. This one criminal. And he might have been a scoundrel his whole life. He might have done wicked, and I'm sure he probably did, wicked things. But in that moment, on the cross, in his last hours, with his last breaths, he defended our Jesus. And I hope I meet that man someday. I'd like to shake his hand and tell him thank you. After Jesus was on the cross for several hours, darkness fell. In the middle of the day, it became dark until the afternoon, until three in the afternoon. And at some point, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first line of Psalm 22. He said, I thirst, and they held a sponge of sour wine up to his mouth. He cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then at last he said, it is finished. After hours and hours of hanging there, suffocating, he died. Joseph of Arimathea buried him in his own rock-hewn tomb. There's so many layers of meaning here. From the perspective of Jesus, he's doing his Father's will. He's dying for our sins. From the perspective of Pilate, he's frustrated because he got outmaneuvered. Too bad this guy, this guy died. From Caiaphas' perspective, phew, he's, re he's relieved. There's one less of these messiahs to worry about. From the crowd's perspective, he's a false messiah and he got what he deserved. From the soldier's perspective, it's just another day. Another criminal executed. I'm going to go home and eat dinner. From the penitent thief's perspective, this man just gave him a golden ticket to the kingdom of God. <laughs> I mean, it's like, Jesus never does that. You, you read Jesus all throughout the, his interactions with people. He never gives anybody some sort of like guarantee and says, don't worry, you're definitely going to be there, man. I'll, I'll see to it, you're in the kingdom. Just this one man. The man and he, he dares to ask. He says, when you come in your kingdom, remember me. Jesus says, I say to you today, I don't have to wait till I come into my kingdom. I'll tell you right now, you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> so the thief had a good day. And then from the disciples' perspective, Terror, trauma, horror, confusion. Most of them are just off hiding somewhere. But from God's perspective, I'm sure there's a lot of sorrow, but he sees the end of the plan. He knows that with Jesus' last breath, with those last three words, it is finished. The deal is sealed. Everything that needs to happen has happened, and he's just waiting for the moment of resurrection. We know from Jesus' uh, Last Supper that he said that his death, well, he says, take and eat, this is my body. And then he says, this, the cup is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So we know Jesus knew what he was doing. He recognized that his blood was for the forgiveness of sins. Though many sinned against him, Jesus never lashed out. Though they reviled him, he did not revile in return. Though he suffered, he uttered no threats. Instead, he continued entrusting himself to God, the just judge. And then he died. So let's take a break and we'll come back and look at resurrection.
heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. Can you just imagine the embarrassment of the disciples? He's already told you stop sleeping, and then he found you sleeping again, and they didn't even know what to say. And so he went away, and now Jesus is totally alone. He's spiritually alone. His, his, his top three closest disciples are literally sleeping on the job. They're not even praying along with him. His other disciples, who even knows what they're doing? They're probably arguing about who's the greatest. <laughs> and there is Jesus alone with his God on his face a third time in prayer. And his prayer, once again, is simple. Let this pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In other words, I will do it if it's the only way. Then he came back and he found his disciples asleep again. He woke them up and he said, they're coming. And Judas approached and he came up to Jesus, identifying him with a kiss. And Jesus said, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And then they arrested him and took Jesus away. The band that came was a band of soldiers and officers from the chief priests. Historical Jesus 15, crucifixion. Because the Gospels have so much to say about the crucifixion of Jesus, including his arrest, the trials, and the actual crucifixion itself, and we are just going to spend 30 minutes, it's necessary that I leave out all sorts of details. And so I may leave out details that you love the best, and if that happens, I'm sorry, it's not on purpose. I'm just going to cover a, a, an abbreviated version of his arrest, trials, and crucifixion in an effort to really highlight four scenes. The first is I'm going to begin in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then I'm going to look at how Jesus stood before Caiaphas and then before Pilate. And then last of all, the crucifixion itself. And then next, we'll look at the resurrection. So... Last time we left off, if you remember, we were at the Last Supper, and Judas had left during the Last Supper, and he had gone off, and then Jesus went on and he taught and explained to them how they should carry on when, he, when he's gone. And then he prayed for a whole chapter, John chapter 17, Jesus prayed, and then after that they sang a hymn and they went to the Mount of Olives. Right? Have you ever prayed a prayer like this where... God, all things are possible for you, and then you ask what you want. And so when he says, take this cup from me, he's not talking about a physical cup. He's talking about the cup of suffering that he's about to endure. He does not want to, he knows what it's going to look like, how nasty it's going to be, and he wants to know if there's another way out. And this is not him going through the motions. This is him in sincerity, in the darkness of the garden, shaking on the ground before his God, praying and petitioning. And then he came back, and he found them sleeping, it says in verse 37. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so he went away a second time, to pray by himself. And this time he said, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. You know, we get just little summaries of what he said. I'm sure there were probably other words he used. But there's an intensity of heart here. And he came back again and found them sleeping. And the scripture says their eyes were very... And he brings them to a certain place and... He says to them, sit here while I pray. And then he grabs three of his other closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and he takes them and, and he walks with them a little farther, and then he says to them, watch and pray here. And then he goes a little farther. Actually, what he says to them, what he says to them, and this is just to the three, is, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. It gives you a picture of what Jesus emotionally was going through here. He, it says that he was distressed. He was troubled. He was sorrowful. Jesus was shaken. 
in this time. He went a little farther. He fell to the ground and he prayed these words. Mark 14, 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. This prayer tells us that Jesus did not want to die. He did not want to go through with it. You don't ask for another way if you want to go through with it. And when they came to the Mount of Olives, they arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane. And when that was happening, we read in John 18 that Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Just in case you're curious, Gethsemane means oil press. So this is the oil press, a place where you squeeze the olives to get the olive oil out. Uh, at least maybe it had been, it wasn't anymore, maybe it was still in operation, I don't know, but that's what Gethsemane means, and that's the garden he was at. It's still there today, although the site is disputed, but you can visit all the potential sites of Gethsemane in Israel today. And uh, so this is Jesus' last chance to escape. This is it. He knows what G Judas is doing, and he's gone to the place he knows Judas knows he'll be. And these are his last moments of temptation to abort the plan, Operation Salvation. And, it, and if he hedges here, if he escapes here, if he runs away or somehow diverges here, everything gets messed up. So Jesus has to stay true. And, and this is the calm before the storm. He's in this garden. It's dark. He has his disciples with him. 